This is the fourth in our series of uh, mini lectures on Lacan's notion of the big other. To begin with, I'd like to pick up on a couple of the ideas that we introduced in the previous lecture. And one of those was an attempt to link Lacan's idea of the big other to the Freudian notion of the other scene. Now, I've utilized uh, this book before. This is John Muller and William Richardson's classic text, Lacan and Language, where they uh, attempted a whole series of introductory commentaries on Lacan, some of Lacan's more difficult writings. And uh, they comment on this link between the two concepts. So I just want to, to quickly stress that. This is what they say. Freud's other scene, the dimension of the unconscious, this other place is what Lacan calls the other, the big other. How does it function in relationship to the subject as a kind of discourse, bits of which emerge into our conscious life in certain privileged moments, in dreams, slips of the tongue, flashes of wit? The other is thus the locus from which the question of the subject's existence may be presented to him. The question as it emerges from the other is a genuine putting of the subject into question. So just to say a few things about that, you'll get a sense in that quote how it's a little bit of paraphrase from their interpretation of Lacan using some of Lacan's concepts, mixing the two up. But what they effectively do is they stress that the bigger that could be read as Lacan's attempt to reformalize and redescribe something of Freud's idea of the other scene. There's two important implications of that. The first of which is that by focusing on the big other, the big other of the treasury of signifiers, the big other of language, what Lacan is doing and what by extension Muller and Richardson are making us do is to take much more seriously the speech of the patient or the psychoanalysand, the patient of psychoanalysis. They're reiterating again the kind of technical priority of listening to what the patient is saying, how they are saying it what Lacanians sometimes refer to as the materiality of the speech, how things are enunciated, and paying very great attention to the discourse, the words, the verbalizations as it is spoken. That is the primary way of accessing the unconscious. And you could say that Lacan's notion of the big other, premised as it is on an understanding of language, is a crucial way of underlining that set of priorities. So that's the first point that I wanted to mention. The second point, though, is rather than just saying the other scene as a kind of tableau of the unconscious, as a kind of place of fantasies being pictured, by focusing on the big other and the subject's relationship to the big other and how the big other is always problematizing the, the subject, or as Mullen Richardson put it, the other is the locus from which the question of the subject's existence may be presented to him. It is a genuine putting of the subject into question. That relationship between the subject and the big other is one which is, is, is constantly generating questions. And I ended the last lecture by foregrounding that question, which you could say is a kind of formula of fantasy for Lacan. What does the other want? By being put into question by the apparent desires and wishes and lacks of the big other, that questioning process is, in a way, one way of approaching the Lacanian notion of fantasy. So I just want to keep that idea in mind, that once Lacan reformulates the notion of the other scene in terms of the big other, it's also putting in place a series of echoing existential questions, the subject wondering, what must I do, what must I be, in response to the big other. That's a very useful way of thinking about fantasy. We can immediately take a further point from that. Fantasy here is not simply a picture of what I desire, but fantasy is very much more in this situation a question of how do I locate myself in terms of what might be desired by the other. It's much more a case of where to position myself in terms of what is desirable. It's not simply that I want something, I wish for it, I now try to possess it. It's an attempt, an ongoing reiterated attempt, which is kind of refreshed, refurbished again and again. What does the other want? What must I be now? Or what must I try to provide now? So just to, to, to keep that uh, introductory set of comments in mind. So having then stressed that further link between Freud and Lacan, we can now ask 
another question. A question about this concept of the big other. And I mentioned this maybe two lectures ago. Is the big other inside or is the big other outside? In some respects, the big other seems to be inside us if we treat the big other as the mother tongue, as the the otherness of language through which we're expressing ourselves, through which we think about ourselves, through which we understand and formulate our existence. In that respect, the big other is very much a part of any speech or linguistic process, cognitive or otherwise, that we use to understand ourselves and locate ourselves. It seems inside. But on the other hand, we've also suggested that the big other is, by necessity, a non-psychological concept. Can't be reduced merely to the stuff of psychology. So it seems to be definitively outside. So what are we to do with this, this tension? Is it inside or is it outside? Now, our first response would be to say, perhaps part of the, the genius or the usefulness of Lacan's concept is that it defies any kind of simplistic inside-outside categorization. And I think that's a crucial and valid point. One of the reasons that I'm so eager on stressing that here and now is the closer we get to thinking about what the unconscious might be for Lacan, the more important it is that we're not swayed into this kind of binary categorical inside-outside thinking. Because ultimately, the Lacanian unconscious can't be located simply inside or outside. Lacan will go on to talk about it, or Lacanians go on to talk about the conscious as trans-individual, as not simply being reduced either to an individual unconscious or, or neither being reduced to a kind of collective Jungian unconscious of symbols alone. It's somehow indivisibly between those two things. But that's a, a series of distinctions we'll come to later. I suppose for now, I just want to foreground that it is a question is the big other functioning on the inside? Is the big other functioning on the outside? I want to say that Lacan's theorizing seems to want to break down that distinction at one level. As I put it here, the big other seems indivisibly between inside and outside. So that's an important first conclusion to make. But perhaps it's worthwhile exploring it a little bit more. I want to refer quickly to, to the, the concepts that two colleagues have um, offered in response to this question. Is the other inside? Is the other outside? The first, and again, I'm drawing on my book, Six Moments in Lacan. The first is a comment by Darian Leader, and he notes the following. The big other is a place from which you are heard, from which you are recognized. The other is thus the place of language, which is external to the speaker. And yet, since he or she is a speaker, it's internal at the same time. So this gives us a second response. On the one hand, we've said that the Lacanian theory of the big other problematizes the very inside-outside distinction, I think a valid conclusion. Now we're also saying that, well, it seems to, in a sense, in a qualified sense of language and the spoken use of my singular articulated use of speech, it seems to exist both in a way parenthetically, in inverted commas, inside my speaking abilities and outside. So it kind of does both at the same time without being reduced to either. To that view, we can add another one. This is by uh, Renata Selechel, and she offers what I think is, is a really nice way of approaching this. She says, the big other is a world of symbolic rules and codes. As such, it does not belong merely to the psychic level. It is a radically external, non-psychological universe of symbolic codes, regulating our psychic self-experience. It's a mistake either to internalize the big other and reduce it to a psychological fact, or to externalize the big other and reduce it to institutions in social reality. So again, we have a view here that the big other cannot be reduced to either side of an internal, external dichotomy. It, it can't be reduced to either of those. It exists indivisibly between. One thought that we could then offer is just to say, our thoughts and psychic subjectivity is much more overdetermined than we typically imagine. And structurally, structural features like the law are also invested with fantasy. 
In other words, you could say what we typically think is merely the internal intra-psychic individual domain of my unconscious. That in Lacanian theory is no longer somehow isolated, insulated from the outside world. The very stuff of my unconscious is signifiers, is words, is material from the big other. So that is no longer in any insulated, cut off way, merely intra psychic. In fact, you could say, in, in, in a way, maybe at a, to risk a slight exaggeration, there is no category of the purely intra psychic in Lacanian psychoanalysis. So just as one can problematize the notion of the internal and show that signifiers, the big other words, are in a sense overdetermining what I'm trying to say, you could also say that, and Salatral does that when she says that, let's see if we can find her words, it's a mistake to wholly externalize the big other and reduce it to institutions and social reality. Even those things that we see and we view as definitively, determinately external to us, structures of the law, various social institutions, we can also problematize the notion that they are merely external because presumably they are a screen for fantasies, for phantasmatic investments and things like the law, even when it exists as a social institution which seems wholly apart from me, is animate, is given some psychical energy, some investment by me. In other words, we've done a couple of different arguments about the inside-outside distinction. Number one, we've said Lacan's uh, theorization of the big other complicates that as a neat distinction. You can't make that. On the other, we've said that it seems to, in a very carefully qualified way, the big other seems to be existence as both internal and external. And then we've also said that you can't reduce it to either of those. But one of its useful analytical applications is to ask ourselves when we think something is merely social or structural, in what ways is it also psychical? And when we think something is merely psychical, we need to pay attention also to how it's, as it were, overdetermined, informed by, made out of the very stuff of signifiers and the symbolic big other. So that, I think, is a useful little piece of work. Continuing in that vein, we're trying to make some important conceptual distinctions, some analytical distinctions in how we use the concept of the big other. We could return very briefly just to ask what actually is the difference between the little other, my mirror image, and the, the big other? This is a, a question I think I posed at the very first lecture uh, on the topic of the big other. And hopefully by now we've given a series of answers to be able to, to think about where we're located with respect to that question. But just in case people are still wondering, how do we differentiate the little other from the big other? I'm going to give us another quote from Dylan Evans's introductory dictionary of Lacanian psychoanalysis to try to substantiate that distinction. Before we do it, though, let's also bear in mind that it's not impossible that the same individual within a momentary or a delimited time frame can occupy the position of the little other. In other words, my mirror image, the person who I look to, who I see myself in, my specular image, as well as being the big other. Now, that sounds problematic. Haven't you just said, Derek, that we want to spend a bit of time differentiating the two? Well, we could think of some examples. Uh, this one, I'm guessing, is maybe a, a Slavoj Žižek example. I'm not sure I remember. But one can imagine that you're attending um, court proceedings. You've got to go to court for some other reason. Before you actually enter the courtroom, you go to the men's room or the women's room or whatever. And uh, there's some, you know, like, dude is peeing or whatever, combing his hair. You smile, whatever, wash your hands. You leave the room thinking this was not a very impressive looking figure. And this guy, what was he doing there? Anyways, you go and you go into the court of law. And lo and behold, 10 minutes later, it's the same guy who comes up and uh, behind the main whatever pedestal part of the room and bangs his gavel and it's the judge. So it's important both to be able to differentiate what's the specular image, mirror image, imaginary little other like me. Um, and the big other, but also to appreciate that the big other isn't simply fixed and that, in fact, you can imagine a situation when what was initially a mirror image counterpart, imaginary little other, goes on to occupy the position of the big other. Another way of thinking about that example, of course, is in Freud's famous distinction. 
he's trying to think about in his group psychology, he's trying to think about what is it? What is it that maintains identification? What is it that holds together a group identity? And he gives two famous examples. One is of the Catholic Church and the other is in the military. And just to, to move things along, we can simply say that for him, for Freud, there's two different lines of identity or two different lines of identification. Or actually, he even puts it in these terms, two identificatory lines of love. In other words, if I'm a grunt, whatever, at the lowest level of the, the military, one of my lines of identification or axes of identification will be with my fellow grunts, my infantry guys, the, 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 the bunch of us, the band of brothers who suffer together, who look similar, who swear in the same way, who wear the same outfit. That's a kind of band of brothers identification. Or to put it in the Kenyan terms, that's an imaginary identification with my imaginary counterparts, with my potential mirror image other colleagues. I often like to think about that as this kind of uh, horizontal line of identification. But says Freud, that's not enough. You need another line of identification. It's not enough simply to have that uh, horizontal band of brothers. We suffer together, we fight together, we die for one another thing. If we are indeed going to get to the I'll die for you, we need to have another line of identification. This line of identification, says Freud, is to the figure of the general. Or if we would put it in more Lacanian terms, it wouldn't just be the figure of the general, but what the general stands for. The values of the U.S. military, for example, the values of country, the values of honor, all of those things. So the soldiers are bonded and have that identification, not only in the imaginary level, the band of brothers who look like me, but also with the place, the place of values, the more symbolic axis of identification. And I just wanted to stress that because in echoing those ideas, I'm responding to a question that I posed right early on when we were talking about the mirror stage. I mentioned that the mirror stage, the taking on of an image involves an ideal ego. It involves one facet of the ego, the ideal ego. In terms of the distinction I've just made with Freud's account of the band of brothers, the soldiers, we can see that ideal image, the ideal ego mirror image of my fellow soldiers. But if we're going to account for the ego ideal, the place of symbolic ego or symbolic values that all of the soldiers look to to gain a kind of more hierarchical vertical axis of identification, that would be symbolic values. So whereas this level, the horizontal level of imaginary identifications can be thought of as ideal ego identifications, we can think about this one, the vertical axis, which implies some hierarchy, some power. Indeed, it implies the operation of the big other. That axis of identification with the values of the general would be considered ego ideals. So just to throw that in here, there's a useful analytical distinction between uh, ideal ego and ego ideal. But back to this question then, how might we be sure that we've separated big other from little other? Dylan Evans, very economical with his words, says this. The little other is the other who's not really an other, but a reflection and projection of the ego. He is simultaneously the counterpart and the specular image. Okay, the point we've just made. It's an imaginary other, a little other. On the other hand, the big other designates radical alterity, radical otherness. An otherness which transcends the illusory otherness of the imaginary, because it cannot be assimilated through imaginary identification. Lacan equates the radical alterity with language and the law, and hence the big other is inscribed in the order of the symbolic. Indeed, for Lacan, the big other is the symbolic, insofar as it is particularized for each subject. So, that means, I think, that we've been able to distinguish between little other and big other, and just to note, uh, in Lacanian algebra, that is the particular uh, topological way of depicting some of these concepts, little others are often depicted with a little a, whereas the big other is depicted with a capital A, la grande autre, the big other, with a capital A. And of course, in later Lacan, we even get this dramatic move where the big A is crossed out, which is another way of saying the big other does not exist. Now, at this point, a lot of people want to like, tear up their Dylan Evans and wrench out uh, handfuls of hair and say, you just spent four hours telling us 
about the big other. No, that big other doesn't exist. And then at this point I say, ah, I feel your pain, but I've also wrenched out bits of my hair, but let's just take a breather because to say the big other doesn't exist actually fits perfectly with what we said in the last lecture. The big other exists as an operational principle. We need to act and uh, engage with one another as if the big other exists, but ultimately in any kind of substantiated form of the other as whatever, the president, whatever, we need to bear in mind that that doesn't exist in a definitive objectified way other than the fact that we constantly hypothesize, project, and have transferential engagements with that big other. Right, two more points that we should quickly broach before we try and wrap up. Um, <clears throat> early on, I gave the example of the big other as the rules of the game. And an example of the big other as being instantiated by a referee who comes onto the field and separates two sports persons who are having a fight. What's nice about that example is not only does it separate this instantiation of the big other from the imaginary others of the players, but it also shows how the big other is the representative of the rules of the game. So we got that. We like that example. But there's a problem here because as all sports fans know, the big other of the referee sometimes gets it wrong. So what are we saying? What are we saying? The big other is lacking. The big other is not perfect. The big other is a problem. I think that is what we're saying. But the kind of poignancy of this moment is that at some level, often we want the big other to be perfect, to get it right. But of course, what Lacan is trying to get us to understand is that the big other is in a way a representative of a kind of conventionalized consensual agreement, which doesn't mean that it's always right. The big other is lacking. The big other makes mistakes. And I suppose the added poignancy of that is just to say that the big other authorizes a kind of truth. The big other, just to reiterate, authorizes a kind of truth. That truth doesn't necessarily have to be by some kind of empirical standards absolutely perfectly true. But the big other who says, he scored it, give him the points, even when he didn't, maybe the referee makes a mistake. The point is that that is the recorded history of that moment. In other words, the functioning of the big other is to, is to underline and substantiate a given type of truth. But that truth doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, often isn't. Another nice way of trying to make this point is sometimes uh, in Olympic athletes training schedules and their training programs, they're training an awful lot. We can imagine, and presumably this has happened more than once, Michael Phelps, take my hat off to you just for a moment. Michael Phelps does a whole lot of swimming. He's training all day long. It's more than conceivable, we should give him a call, maybe it's already happened, that in his training, he breaks the world record, breaks his own world record, maybe by a considerable margin. Does that count? Is that the new world record? No, because the big other has to be there to authorize it, to see it. It needs to be... Uh, 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 it needs to be documented by the big other. So just to make that point, when the big other becomes operative, we have a kind of symbolic reality and a symbolic truth. That symbolic truth is important because it entails a degree of consensual belief. It entails a historical dimension because that's the authorized truth as seen by, as documented, as evidenced by the big other. But as we all know, that's not the complete truth. It may well have been that any number of athletes have far outperformed their world records in private, but in a sense that doesn't get recorded. It doesn't get made. It doesn't attain the degree of a historical truth. Now, there's an awful lot more we could say about that, which because of restraints of time, we won't. But I would like to just throw out this idea of what domains of human activity are we involved in when we try to deliberately avoid symbolic registration. In other words, we're trying to not let the other know some facet of our behavior. It's a fascinating topic, and I think our next set of lectures will start with that, this attempt to avoid symbolic registration, or indeed some of the complications that arrive, arise from the fact of there being a degree of symbolic registration. Last point then, and thank you for hanging in there. Last point is,
we're supposed to be talking about desire. Why is desire important? Well, desire is important because, in a way, the big other concept doesn't even operate, isn't doing what Lacan wants it to do unless we involve the question of desire in that equation. So here's a slight critical comment to make on the kind of Slavoj Žižek ideology, philosophically rich use of the notion of the big other. Often the concept there takes on a value of social consensus, uh, etiquette, polite, all of those, it becomes a treasury of signifiers. And again, I'm aware that you know, Žižek and all his colleagues know this, so it's not a critique that I'm making in any absolute way. But reading a lot of that literature, sometimes one can forget that it's the desire of the other which is crucial within clinical work. It's not just the functioning of the other, but how the other divides me, the other uh, hystericizes me, makes me question. And so let's end today then just by stressing that one of the most important elements in Lacan's idea of the big other and the other as it relates to the clinical subject is that the big other is the, the fulcrum, the instantiation of desire. So that returning question, what does the other want? What does the other desire? Helps us to advance to Lacan's use of Hegel's comment. Desire is always the desire of the other. What does that mean? Desire is always the desire of the other. Well, there's a number of ways of trying to formulate that. There's a number of implications of this statement that Lacan lifts from Hegel and gives a distinctively psychoanalytic inflection. And I'd like to close then just by highlighting four potential applications or four potential readings of what that formula, desire is always the desire of the other, might be. To do that, I want to turn to my friend and col colleague Callum Neal's book, The Kenyan Ethics and the Assumption of Subjectivity, and he's got a wonderful account of this. Lacan, he says, formulates desire as always being the desire of the other. Here, Neil continues, the preposition of marks a rich ambiguity, which allows us to understand the complexity of this relation of desire between the subject and the other. Now, there's many different ways we can read that, but let's just pull out four ways of understanding. What does it mean to say the subject's desire is always the desire of the other? I've tried to put it mark it up here, to say that desire is always the desire of the other gives us a matrix of desiring positions. The subject's desire, I'm returning to Callum Neal, the subject's desire is the desire of the other insofar as it is the desire for the other to desire him or her. In other words, the first possible reading of this set of permutations, possible interpretations, meaning of this phrase, is if Desire, the subject's desire is always the desire of the other. It could simply mean that my desire is always in part the desire to be desired by the other. That's number one. The desire to be desired by the other. It's the desire of the other to desire the other. It is also to desire what the other desires, to desire the object of the other's desire. And returning to the one I mentioned before, to be desired by the other also implies to be recognized by the other. Callum Neal also adds another one here, which I think is, is useful. It's not only to desire as the other desires from the position of the desiring other, it's also to desire the otherness of what is desired. So I said only four, but we've ended up with five different readings of that idea. That desire is always the desire of the other means I desire the other, I desire the other to desire me, I desire the other's recognition, I desire what the other desires, and I also desire as the other. I desire as the other in a sense that puts me in the position of the desiring other. And of course, underlying all of that is the desiring of otherness as such, which keeps desire going. Because if desire is simply stable, understood, the same, it loses its desirable qualities. So there's a whole matrix of different understandings and interpretations of desire. But let's end there by stressing once again that perhaps the most crucial clinical application of thinking about the symbolic other is precisely to be able to try and consider how the other unsettles the subject, how the other divides the subject and puts that subject's existence into question and gets 
the engine of the subject's desire moving in a multiple different ways. What they desire, who they desire, how they should desire, the desire to be desired, the desire for recognition and the desirousness of the otherness itself is that thing which keeps desire going.